Okay, let's open in a word of prayer today. Father, we just thank you for the time we can spend together discussing these issues. Pray that you'll um, give me the uh, right things to say today and uh, convey the information in a godly and appropriate fashion. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, today I'm going to talk about itching ears, and I don't know if it applies to anything I have to say or not, but I think I think it does. Um, by the way, just so you know a little bit about my schedule, I won't be here in Columbus the next two weeks. I will be doing an update online. I'll be speaking at a church in Bakersfield, California next Sunday morning called Rock Harbor Church. Spoke there about a year ago. Uh, they're actually, they, they put their things up in an archive. I don't know when, when they get them up. I will record things and then put up a prophecy update, at least with the slides and audio, sometime Sunday afternoon. And then the following Sunday, I don't know if I'll be speaking somewhere or not, but I'll get an update up, at least a brief one, um, on Sunday, December 4th. So uh, just pray we have safe travels. Uh, by the way, Rock Harbor Church this Sunday is having Phil Haney speak. Uh, so if you want to dig up their archive, he spoke there a few weeks ago, about a month ago, uh, and he's coming back. So. I uh, just pray again that everything goes well. So we talk a lot about the convergence of the signs. The, as I sit down and try to distill all the information that I come up with each week, it's becoming increasingly difficult to keep it within a certain the time frames that we have here, since we do have people that you know have other obligations and everything. So. I'm not sure if I've distilled the right things this week or not because I just had a massive amount of information uh, to go through. But in 2 Timothy chapter 4, and this is an interesting passage because it's what Paul wrote right near the end of his life. Uh, he was in prison in Rome. He'd been in prison for a couple of years under house arrest, probably chained to a, a Roman soldier. Uh, he was allowed to receive visitors. And so this is really the thing that, you know, I did a series once called Famous Last Words uh, from people in the Bible, the last things that they wrote, especially when they were under the threat of impending death. And this is an interesting passage that Paul wrote. So this is what was on his heart, uh, what he was inspired to write near the end of his life. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Verse 3, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall heap unto themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. And we really live at that time. Now, this is really directed to the church. But if the church is going to be in a position where they're rejecting sound doctrine and turning their ears to fables and trying to find people to tell them what they want to hear, can we expect any less from the culture at large? And the answer is, I don't think you can in fact, I think it will be worse in the culture at large, and so I'm going to focus on that. Now look, I talk a lot about what goes on in the culture, and I know that there's a lot of unsaved people out there, and so I have low expectations of how they're going to conduct themselves. But the way they conduct themselves does fit into God's prophetic pattern. We talk about the days of Noah, the days of Lot, the days of Noah, they're going to be Marrying and giving in marriage. You're going to be living like nothing is going is happening. But remember in the days of Noah, Noah did preach that judgment was coming, that God was going to do something pretty severe to the earth. The people had a lot of warning. What did they do? Well, Scripture tells us they didn't do anything. The interesting thing about that is, though, before Noah went into the ark, all the animals showed up two by two or in sevens, and still people didn't pay attention, even though that was a pretty clear sign that something was impending, something was coming very soon. 
It's going to be the same way. The same pattern is going to repeat itself in our time. So let's look at some of the things that are just going on and, and try to put them into a little bit of biblical perspective as we can. A good article in the Daily Signal, a lot of people are still upset about this, about the Electoral College. You know, it's going to flip. The people are going to be faithless electors. I did hear a couple of interviews just this morning on Friday's True News, and they interviewed a couple of electors. Uh, one said, you know, I'm not a big fan of Trump, but I'm going to do what the people of Kentucky told me to do. The other one said, I'm a long-standing Republican. I'm 78. He goes, Thursday, the day before the interview, I got over 3,000 emails telling me to change my vote. I'm not going to change my vote. I love Donald Trump. I'm not going to change. So everybody needs to calm down. This, well, I can't say that it is impossible that that won't happen. It is statistically improbable. Uh, I think there have been 106 electors change in the history of the United States. There have been 171, but some of those changed because the person died between the election and taking office. 106 have changed in the hist in the 50 what 57 presidential elections that we've now had. They have to flip. I think Trump has 306 right now. They have to flip 28 because she has to get to um, she has to get to 270. So she can't if they only flip uh, no they think 38. 38. That's, I'm sorry, they have to flip 38. Because if they only flip 37, then it's a tie 269 to 269. And then what happens? It goes into the House of Representatives. Each state gets a vote. It's all planned out in the Constitution. I'm not worried about it. This guy, you should go, go look up True News in the early part of the show. He interviewed this guy from Scottsdale, Arizona. And he just said, you know, I'm not going to change my vote. You know, they're harassing me. He's getting thousands of, I mean, he got 3,000 one day. Because what they did was they took their name, home address, telephone number, and emails and published them in a database, as many as they could find. And so these people are getting really inundated with phone. They've had, they've had to change phone numbers that they've had for a long time. Because the left doesn't, look, they lost. They don't want to admit it. And they're going to try. This is what they always do. They never will quit. Do you think they're going to suddenly go into the next Congress and they're going to cooperate and do what President Trump and the Republicans want to do? I don't think, now that, that's a lot that they won't do that. It's statistically impossible that they would change at this point. So that's just, so some interesting slides on the Electoral College. This is a slide, uh, it shows it took out all the parts that voted for Clinton out of a map of the United States. By the way, this is in the New York Times, so I know a lot of people don't. I like the New York Times. I know that they're, you know, they have a left-wing perspective, you know, but they've got to tell the truth sometimes, or nobody would ever buy anything that they sell. Um, so this is it's kind of an interesting map. You can look it up or maybe freeze frame this. And, you know, for example, they have um, the Detroit Delta up here, you know, that voted for, for Clinton. They have the... Um, the Santa Fe Sea, because uh, New Mexico went for, uh, for Clinton. And then they have you know, a lot of empty areas there. The Las Vegas Harbor, Los Angeles Bay, San Francisco Bay. You know, what it would look like if it, the landmass was just this. And then this, this would be the landmass for Clinton, uh, the areas that she carried. So Ramirez um, had, does a great job on editorial cartoons. Um, and this is, a, I mean, this is a very interesting, and this is why the founders of the United States put in place an electoral college so that the populous states wouldn't overwhelm the less populous states. We're a constitutional republic. So if somebody says, well, she won the popular vote, it's like, you know, that's an interesting historical fact, but it's not the way we elect our presidents. It's never been the way we elect our presidents. And if they told you that, go ask for your money back from the college that you took civics or political science from, because obviously they didn't tell you about the founding documents of the United States. This is what the map would look like if, the, if 
you bit if it was based on population. And so you see there are New York, Florida, Texas, and California really would dominate a presidential election. I mean, California already gets 55 of the five. They get over 10% of the electoral votes in that state. So without the Electoral College, those states would dominate. In fact, I think, I can't remember the exact number. There are, I'm trying to remember, 7,000 counties or so in the United States. And Hillary Clinton won uh, less than 60. She carried less than 60. Now she carried ones with great population. If you took those counties out, Trump would have like a 7 million vote plurality in the popular vote. So those, those counties are very predominant, but that's why the, ele the founders set it up this way. And even though it's in the Constitution that this is the way we will vote for president, there's some professor at Hofstra who says that the electoral, co he makes an argument that the electoral college system for choosing the president is unconstitutional even though it's in the Constitution. And listen, this is, this is the way they think. You need to understand it. it it's postmodernism run amok. They, they don't think rationally. I'm sorry. They think emotionally and with their feelings. And this thinking now permeates, it's, has carried over into the church, though. And you have a lot of people, they will go around. I, I was reading a blog this week by someone who used to be a very, you know, straight down the line, pre-mill, Bible prophecy, and now he's like, well, I'm not really into that because I've discovered that God is love. And now that has, and so I can't, I can't really accept penal substitutionary atonement as a doctrine. And he's changed, and this has happened in just two years. And... Um, and this is what has happened in a lot of the church. People go with their feelings. God is love predominates. That's why you have social justice predominating in a lot of things. And people just aren't thinking rationally. They aren't looking at what the Scripture says because they, they feel better about themselves if God is love, and that's all they have to worry about. And so that's why we have every week you read about Christians caving on the same-sex marriage issue. One after one, a lot of these, uh, uh, Jen Hatmaker, I mentioned her, some of these other women at conferences. There's another fairly popular woman. I can't remember her name. I think her last name is Mellon. Uh, she came out this week and said, you know, I'm divorced, and now I'm living with my girlfriend, this some big soccer, you know, woman soccer star, or former woman soccer star. And, and my husband's okay with it, and we have the modern, a modern family. You know, so I have the kids, and husband comes over, and I have my les lesbian lover, and it becomes feelings-based, not what the scripture says. So, uh, David Brooks, writing in the New York Times, in an editorial a couple days after the election, said this. He's talking about what do we do? And he's supposedly one of the conservative guys at the New York Times. So this is what he says. The job for the rest of us is to rebind the fabric of society, community by community, and to construct a political movement for the post-Trump era. I suspect the coming political movements will be identified on two axes, open and closed and individual and social. Those who believe in open trade, relatively open immigration, and active foreign policy and racial integration and then those who believe in closed believe in um, protective trade, closed borders, a withdrawn foreign policy, and ethnic separatism. Now, this is, this is a classic example of a straw man. A straw man in an argument is you, you build a straw man and then you knock it over. But the straw man, the reason it's called a straw man is it doesn't really represent what the other side believes. So David Brooks is great at making these, well, a lot of people on the left are making these straw man arguments all the time. He says this, Trump's bigotry, dishonesty, and promise breaking will have to be denounced. We can't go morally numb, but he needs to be replaced with a program that addresses the problems that fueled his ascent. 
After all, the guy will probably resign or be impeached within a year. The future is closer than you think. Interestingly enough, uh, to show how editorial columnists get it wrong a lot of the times, in um, Haaretz said this in May of 1940 following an election in another country. But just sort of see how it applies. You see the same things being written about uh, President Trump. The man now elected to stand as the head of this empire is a verbal bully, a chauvinist, a misanthropope, aggressive and looking for conflict. He is a rude man whose face is red from alcohol, who acts like a bulldog, and whose voters voted for him for reasons of paranoia and nationalistic fueled feelings against an imaginary enemy. May of 1940, what was going on in Europe? Oh, who are they talking about? Winston Churchill. We had a great comment about, um, I, I better not say it, about the late, look it up, he was, a lady accused him of being drunk at a party and he had a very good comeback. So, well, I'll, I'll, I'll tone it down. I won't do it in the Churchillian way. I'll just, Madam, I may be drunk, but tomorrow morning I'll be sober and you'll still not be so good looking. That's what he said. <laughs> and um, he had a way. So the pres vice president went to see this Hamilton. And there are all these articles out there. Immigrants who came to the US as children feared deportation under Trump. And Muslims are upset, and minorities are upset, and all this, everybody's got their feelings hurt. And even Peggy Noonan, who used to I do speech writing for President Reagan, has to think, what to tell your kid about Trump? You know, and my five-year-old my five -year -old is fearful of Trump. Well, your five-year-old is fearful of Trump because you told him to be. You know, a five-year-old really didn't care about politics. And so you're fueling this fear. So Vice President um, Pence goes to New York to this movie, Hamilton. It's the very popular musical in New York right now. I think the minimum price for a ticket to get in is $365 or $385. Uh, now there's a boycott Hamilton thing. Because if this happened at the end, Pence got up to leave, and the cast was out there for, you know, to take their bows, and this is what happened. You know, we had a, a, a guest in the audience this evening. And Vice President-elect Pence, I see you walking out, but I hope you will hear us just a few more moments. We have a we have a message for you, sir. We hope that you will hear us out. And I encourage everybody to pull out your phones and tweet and post because this message needs to be spread far and wide, okay? Vice President-elect Pence, we welcome you and we truly thank you for joining us here at Hamilton and American Musical. We really do. We, sir, we are the diverse America who are alarmed and anxious that your new administration will not protect us. Our planet. <laughs> our parents or defend us and uphold our inalienable rights, sir. But we truly hope that this show has inspired you to uphold our American values and to work on behalf of all of us. All of us. told by a diverse group of men and women of different colors, creeds, and orientations. Well, uh, I don't think people paid, you know, $385 to go and be preached at like that. And Pence, to his credit, he stopped, stood outside in the hallway and listened and then left. Um, but really, I mean, this thing is... The story is about Alexander Hamilton, who, by the way, was not a liberal, what you would consider to be a liberal in today's politics. Uh, as you know, the story of Alexander Hamilton, he actually got into a duel with um, a, a Aaron Burr, who was then the vice president, I believe, and, and was shot and killed. And Burr later tried to get some of the states, and he was charged with treason. And Aaron Burr, by the way, was the grandson of the famous Puritan preacher, Jonathan Edwards. I don't know if you know that. And uh, the church curmudgeon, he had a response to this thing about Hamilton. He said, 
Uh, it sounds like this Hamilton thing has put a burr under everyone's saddle. <laughs> so uh, the church curmudgeon has a lot of very great things. For example, another tweet that he had recently was, funny how the deconstructionists act surprised when everything falls apart. And uh, it's interesting. And so we have this culture that's kind of built around, uh, in, listen, to be honest, it was the generation you know, of us that did all the participation trophies and everything. Uh, I didn't want to play the clip because I didn't want to run up against the Copyright Act, uh, but the sequel to Meet the Parents, um, they go to the childhood home, Robert De Niro and Blythe Danner, the parents of the gal that Ben Stiller, Gaylord Fokker has married. They go to his childhood home, and there his father, played by Dustin Hoffman, and his mother, played by Barbara Streisand, have created in his childhood bedroom the wall of Gaylord. And uh, De Niro is here, and the, what De Niro says at this point is he kind of looks and he goes, wow, I didn't know they gave ribbons for ninth place. To which Dustin Hoffman's father, Dustin Hoffman says, oh, yeah, Jack, they give them all the way down to 10th. Like, that's normal. So we kind of created this issue. Um, Brian McLaren weighed in. He said he's disappointed that a majority of his fellow Christians supported a man who used racism, misogyny, Islamophobia, and other anti-Christian strategies as an election strategy. He hoped that the younger generations will forge a new path. Quote, I hope that younger generations of evangelicals will turn away from the leaders their parents followed in voting for Donald Trump and find a new and better way to be Christian so their politics will be driven less by greed and fear and more by love. I hope that white evangelicals will come to terms at long last with the racism and religious prejudice that are deeply embedded in the evangelical tradition, often at levels evangelicals aren't aware of. Because why? Because Brian McLaren is smarter than all the white evangelicals. This is an arrogant, postmodern man. He is a heretic. I very, very rarely use that term. You know that. He is. And he is to be avoided at all costs. But he has done tremendous damage to the evangelical movement in the United States. Another thing that they're talking about is uh, sanctuary cities. We're not going to, if, if Trump decides to deport felony criminals, we're not going to help because our city is a sanctuary city. And so mayors of the very safe cities of New York and Chicago have come out and said, we're going to continue to be a city that's safe for immigrants. Not safe for anybody else much, but you know we're going to ignore what the president wants to do. So if the president wants to come in and round up people that are here illegally, that were convicted of crimes that shouldn't have been allowed to come, first of all, what somebody needs to do is somebody needs to get take de Blasio, the mayor of New York, down to the harbor there at Battery Park and get on a boat and go out to Ellis Island and take a tour of what happened at Ellis Island where they held people in quarantine for an extended period sometimes so they could be vetted, so they could be uh, made sure they didn't have a disease or anything like that. That's how immigration ran in this country for a long time. Now the president, my understanding is, has suspended air patrols across the southern border of the United States. I also saw a picture, I don't have it in my thing, of the border wall that exists, that Mexico erected between it and Guatemala. But they object to the one that we might erect between us and them. That really is the definition of hypocrisy, okay? That, that, that really is. So what do we do if these, these mayors don't do? Well, there is a thing that we have called the Constitution. And in Article 6 of that Constitution, there is a thing called the Supremacy Clause, and it says this, this Constitution and the laws of the United States, which shall be made in pursuance thereof, and all treaties made, or which shall be made under the authority of the United States, shall be the supreme law of the land, and the judges in every state shall be bound thereby, anything in the Constitution or laws of any state, to the contrary notwithstanding. And so these people are anti-constitutionalists. They don't care about the Constitution. Don't ever let me hear anybody say that Rahm Emanuel or uh, de Blasio in New York care about the Constitution. They don't. 
They care about themselves and furthering their own agenda and their feelings. That's what they care about. This is called the Supremacy Clause, and it actually is part of the Constitution, and it does give the President the power to, to do things in that regard. That's why, guess what, we haven't been really people that have concerns about the immigration policies of Obama. We really haven't been able to do anything about it because he's the executive in charge. But guess what? There's a new sheriff in town. So what happens when a new sheriff comes to town? The new sheriff is in charge. Goodbye, Obama. Now, but there is, there, so there's immigration thing. It's collapsing Europe. Germany is effectively almost destroyed as a political entity. Even though they made a big show, the president went there and had a joint press conference with Angela Merkel this week. It's just, it's just, it's all for show. They have major, major problems. Uh, but even in Great Britain, the Archbishop of Canterbury said that ISIL is not separate from Islam. This is, to me, this is kind of a stunning development. Here's what he said. Uh, claims that the atrocity of the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant have nothing to do with Islam are harming efforts to confront and combat extremism, the Archbishop of Car Canterbury has insisted. His name is um, James or Jonathan Welby, I, I think. Religious leaders of all varieties must stand up and take responsibility for the actions of extremists who profess to follow their faith. The most reverend Justin Welby, there it is, said, he argued that unless people recognized and attempted to understand the motivation of terrorists, they would never be able to combat their ideology effectively. It follows calls from a series of high-profile figures for people to avoid using the term Islamic State, also known as ISIL, ISIS, and Daesh, because they say its murderous tactics go against Islamic teaching and that using the term could help to legitimize the group's own propaganda. But the Archbishop said it was essential to recognize extremist religious motivation to get to, gr to get grips with the problem. Uh, he also said it's time for countries across Europe to rediscover the Judeo-Christian roots of their culture to find solutions to the mass disenchantment which led to the Brexit vote in the UK and the rise of anti-establishment leaders on the continent and beyond. And it's true, that we have a major problem with um, Islamic terrorism and it's clear that it has you go listen to Phil Haney talk at Rock Harbor today, or the one that he did back on October 19th. He'll tell you the, he'll tell you the, the truth. It's a problem. By the way, there's also a, a radio show I would highly recommend. Um, Frank Gaffney's group, the Center for Security Policy, does a radio show called Secure Freedom Radio. Just look up Secure Freedom Radio on the internet. And he did an interview with Bill Warner of politicalislam.com or politicalislam.org. And it's a very fascinating interview where he talks about the strategy that is employed and that our government right now seems to be unable, at least the government that is on its way out seems to be unable to, to deal with. And so, listen, we, we elected a flawed man as leader. We need to pray for him, and but we also know that he's going to do some things differently than the guy before him, and things that I support, one of which is dealing with this terrorism issue on an honest basis. Here's a little discussion on Sean Hannity with um, um, Farage and uh, Gorka about what needs to be done in this area. Now there's good reason to worry. Now police in Germany, they stage anti-terror raids in 60 cities targeting an ultra-conservative Islamic missionary group which is accused of trying to recruit for ISIS. Now Germany may also have another problem on their hands. From January to June of this year, over 370,000 asylum seekers were registered in that country. U.S. officials have been warning that ISIS will try and infiltrate the refugee population here. I want to talk about this through this prism, the Islamization of Europe and what happened in Germany, because we have James Comey, we have Michael Steinbeck, the assistant FBI director, our CIA director, Brennan, our House Homeland Security Committee chair, McCall, and then 
the former uh, special envoy to defeat ISIS, all have said that ISIS will infiltrate the refugee population. How dangerous has it been for Europe and what can we learn from you? Well, it's been disastrous. And, of course, Angela Merkel took the very opposite policy position to the one that President-elect Trump is taking. She said, if you remember last year, please all come. We can take as many people as you can send. Uh, and what have we seen? Uh, not just a rise of radical groups, uh, the likes of which the German police are trying their best to hunt down today, uh, but also we saw those scenes, remember, on New Year's Eve at Cologne train station. The mass, open, sexual violation of women going on in a western German city. Now, I'm not saying that because I want to demonise anybody, but I am saying this. Uh, what's happened from many of these Middle Eastern countries is the spread of ISIS. I feel uh, that we ourselves may be partly responsible for causing it by toppling uh, Saddam, by getting rid of Gaddafi, but whatever, the fact is, it's there. And remember that in these countries, women are at very best second-class citizens. So at best, we're bringing in a problem, a cultural problem, that is going to be very difficult to assimilate and maintain our values. Mm -hmm. And at worst, we're bringing in people who actually want to kill us. And, and that's what our top intelligence and security officials have been warning. Dr. Gorka, good to see you again, and it'd be great to see you in the, in the Trump administration. Thank you. But look, Donald Trump supports safe zones, victims of a civil war, food, medicine, clothing, supplies, safety, uh, baby formula, whatever is needed, right. cots. Um, there is this clash of cultures, though, that Nigel Farage is talking about, and that is if you grow up and you believe you can tell women what to wear and they can't drive and go to school without a man's permission and gays and lesbians can be killed and marital rape in some of these countries is legal um, and the persecution of Christians and Jews are institutionalized, how do, how do you bring people in from countries that believe that, have been born into that, that is their culture, and expect them to just become Americans, to, in other words, to assimilate immediately. It's, right. a, it's, it's, it's a stretch to me. So, Sean, let's start with the fact that we are a Christian nation. We are a Judeo-Christian nation. So we help people when we can help them. But that is not a contract for national suicide. That doesn't mean, as Hillary Clinton said in her private speech to the bankers, we don't need any borders. Pull down the borders. The whole one, Western Hemisphere. The whole Western Hemisphere, one yeah. big happy party. It doesn't mean that you uh, quintuple the number of refugees. If she had won, what Nigel's talking about, Europe is what America would have been like in five years' time if Hillary had become the president. And that's right. And so, you know, we really should be grateful for that we've dodged the bullet on those things. Uh, look, I don't deny that there are people that need help. Okay? They don't seem to be bringing in any Christian refugees. At least they're way less than 1% of the uh, population. So Trump has started to announce his um, cabinet and other positions that he gets to a point. And so the first three were uh, Mike Flynn as National Security Advisor, which nobody can do anything about, by the way. And look, I have some concerns about uh, General Flynn, about some of the things he's written about Turkey. Uh, but he has been pretty good on the Islamization issue. Uh, but, you know, so that, that's something that bears watching. I mean, he, he worked in the Obama administration as the national intelligence agent, head of the National Intelligence Agency, the sort of like the spy agency for the Pentagon. And he got, they got rid of him because they didn't like what he was saying about uh, radical Islam and those sort of things. And then Jeff Sessions is Attorney General, a senator from Alabama. And then Steve Bannon is a special strategist and advisor. And so what's the charge right away? They're racist. They're all racist. Jeff Sessions is a racist. Steve Bannon is a racist. And I have to tell you, I read a lot about Steve Bannon. I, I find him to be a flawed human being. And he's not perfect. Um, people say, well, Breitbart, white nationalists and the KKK likes the Breitbart website, so I'll have nothing to do with the Breitbart website. Well, you know what? Those guys also cite the Bible. You're going to have nothing to do with the Bible because some stupid, idiot, radical person who you know we can't support at all happens to... You're not... I'm sure there are people that, that watch our church and they, they like our church, but they're messed up theologically. 
Okay, that doesn't mean we stop doing what we do. So everybody that I've read that knows Ben, and with maybe one exception, I've not seen anybody that knows him come out and say he's a racist. And this is what the left does. If we, if you don't agree with us, you're a racist. Uh, Caroline Glick supports him. David, David Horowitz. Uh, on and on and on down the line. Uh, same way with Jeff Sessions. You know, he's being criticized. And in fact, he, uh, Steve Bannon was actually defended on NPR in an interview the other day by a guy named Pollock, I think it was. And Pollock just sort of ran over the interviewer with like things like facts. And so here's what, this was on Breitbart this morning. NPR, after Pollock, no more live interviews for conservatives. So maybe the solution to that is no more NPR. You know? So Sessions has been attacked. Uh, there's an article on Roll Call by Jonathan Al. I'm going to play a little bit of an extended interview because I, it's Tucker Carlson on Fox. There's still some good people on Fox. Interviewing Jonathan Allen. I want you to listen to this carefully and s listen to Jonathan Allen. A, a great interview, great job by Tucker Carlson. He's really doing a good job. And watch him defend what he wrote. And he said, Sessions is a racist. That's essentially what he said. He's unfit for the cabinet. And the subhead title is A Partially Reconstructed Bader of minorities is beyond the ideological French. Listen to this. Many on the left are arguing that Jeff Sessions is morally unfit to serve as Attorney General. Among them, our next guest, columnist Jonathan Allen of Roll Call. Jonathan, thanks a lot for joining us tonight. My pleasure. So you wrote a column about Sessions before today's announcement, but recently. And I got to say, it's one of the most unfair things I think I've ever read. Okay. I mean, well, it's I almost like a pure award. download from the DNC website. You say, among many other things. Sessions is a favorite of Stormfront, the white nationalist web community founded by former Klansman Don Black. Is there any evidence that he's had contact with Stormfront, endorsed Stormfront, or are you just smearing him on the basis of their endorsement of him? Well, I, look, I'm not saying that he's like a member of Stormfront or what are anything. You saying? I'm saying that he is a favorite of people who. Uh, uh, who hold bigoted views, and that's not. That, so, if uh, someone you way, don't like says something nice about you, you're tainted by that. Well, that I think if saying? you look at the history and, and the pattern of Jeff Sessions, he said things over the course of no, time. No, that you you make said something really specific. You said he was endorsed by Stormfront. What is, but I'm sure he would disavow that immediately. So why would, why is that fair to write that? Uh, he hasn't disavowed it that I know of. Oh, so you think he agrees with Stormfront? Is that what you're doing? Do I don't know for that. I don't know, but the point that I would make about Jeff Sessions and the larger point of the column is Americans should have a right to feel that they are going to be equally protected under the law. And Jeff Sessions, over the course of time, and I pointed out a lot of other things in that column, has said and done things that should make people uh, feel, some people feel uncomfortable with the idea that he's going to treat them fairly under the law. I don't think, uh, here's what people have a right to, is the expectation that if someone's going to throw out a charge, that it's substantiated. It's not just by implication. In this McCarthy way, you say, among other things that I'm quoting now, surely Sessions wouldn't try to resegregate the American armed forces in which he served. Really? Jonathan Allen, surely you wouldn't batter a child. What, I mean, what does that mean? Nobody well, no, you're right, I wouldn't. No, but nobody suggested he would resegregate the armed forces. Well, Jeff Sessions has Why been opposed like to the Voting out? Rights Act in the past. Opposed? To, is that the same as resegregating the American armed forces? Well, I mean, that's a really appalling thing well, to say about you know, it's, Well, the, well, wait a second. Uh, it's not that far of a cry for some people. But has that suggestion ever come up? That specific, you wrote you're talking that. about. We're talking about the Attorney General of the United States. I, no, no, we're talking right? about your column. We're talking you about the Attorney General. You suggested that that was even a possibility he would resegregate the U.S. Armed Forces. And I'm asking, where I said he from? wouldn't. Oh, well, you wouldn't beat your wife. I but mean, however, however... You're attacking him, however, but not directly. However, however, yeah. there are... <laughs> this, the Armed Forces of the United States is one of the institutions that is most racially diverse most ethnically diverse in our country, right? right? Lots of people of all sorts of backgrounds in the United States Armed Services. First integrated by Harry Truman way back when. All of those people uh, who are not white people uh, would have to have faith, and the reason that came up is we're talking about a potential defense secretary appointment for him at some point, 
should I be able to have faith that their leader doesn't discriminate against yeah, them or is not prejudiced against them? Because there's literally no possibility that he wants to do that, that he would suggest doing it, or that he would do it. But you're fear-mongering. But by the way, you know what else is a very diverse place? is the state of Alabama, which he's represented for 20 years. It's 25 percent African-American. Can you name, in the 20 years he has served, 19 as senator, a single instance where he's mistreated someone on the basis of his race? Ever. One. Well, senators don't typically walk around mistreating their citizens. You're calling the guy a racist, so why don't you throw some Well, so I'll, here, I'll give you an example of something that I think should worry people if they believe in the equal protection of the law. Right. Uh, when he talks about immigration, right, right. he's a big anti-immigration guy, wants to crack down on immigration. When President Obama said he was going to put 2,000 minors, undocumented minors, in right. Alabama, here illegally. children... Yes, here illegally, children. Okay. In the state of Alabama, Jeff Sessions' response was, we're going to have to treat them and feed them and let them go. Okay. So, so what, I, what's, I, I'm, so missing, I'm missing your point. Was the state not on the hook for feeding and clothing those he kids? He was complaining or? about the idea that, he was going to, that the state of Alabama was going to have to feed and clothe children. Okay, but do you okay, think so that it, makes him that's racist? That's such an awful... I mean, is that, is that your example of his racism? Are you being serious? Uh, first of all, I don't think I called him racist. You called him racist like nine times in the column. I mean, it's... Well, a, no, but if we're going to use the word... And I'm asking you, what's the example of his racism? <laughs> and you don't have one. Wait, so now, wait a second. Saying, well, if you want to go back... No, what you asked me was, what's recent? Yeah, so the in last 1986, one, he's been a U.S. So senator. So in 1986... He's been overwhelming the record. Okay, so the question is, 86, Sessions was Bork before Bork was Bork, Okay. And uh, because he had made, well, I think they talk about, he made a bad joke, okay? He really did. Re-elected for 20 years, and I'm asking of one instance where he's been racist, you don't have one. Are you saying You that, downloaded you saying, some talking points are you from the DNC well, first without of all, I any that, facts. I wrote that column before Sessions was nominated. You clear, I mean, this is just a totally hack job are, are, here. <laughs> you asked me for instances of him doing racist things. You don't have any, yeah. Oh, well, now wait a second. You asked me for recent examples. And your argument, is, is, your argument is that you could serve in the, in the Senate for 20 years, uh, and just because you served in the Senate for 20 years, you were elected to the Senate, you're not racist? My argument that is, is at odds with no, American no. history. My sir. argument is that before you call someone racist and suggest Which that he I has ties to. You do repeatedly. And suggest that he has ties to Stormfront and might resegregate the armed forces, that you might have some facts. At, at, I have you. some facts. You, you don't. In you 1986, he called. The NAACP on American. Really? Because well, I think, I'm sorry, that I was think, during his hearing. He had done it previously. I think the NAACP is a totally discredited group. Does that make me a racist? I mean, let's get back to reality a little bit. You also say, this, I'm, you're not alone in saying this. He is, quote, beyond the ideological fringe. That's true. Really? Because I actually looked up some of his views, which I'm very familiar with. Yeah. What percentage of Americans do you think believe we need to reduce the amount of immigration into this country? I think is a lot a of fringe? Americans. Oh, a majority. Did you I think know that? I think okay. a lot of Americans believe that. So. You it, realize that. Immigration from Mexico right now is actually going the other way. I realize that that has yeah, nothing just, to do with the question I asked. Okay. You said he is on the ideological fringe, and my point is the fringe is far outside the mainstream. And by definition, that view is at the very center of the country. It's the opposite of the fringe. That's one view that he holds that's okay. in the mainstream. So why don't you, since we're on TV Live, give me an example of an opinion he has What's that is difference? on the ideological friend. He wants to ban same-sex marriage. That's on the ideological friend. Is that true? Well, from your well, from your argument about a majority of Americans supporting reduced immigration, well, I thought that you a majority of Americans government. also, but majority of Americans aware also that the majority support same-sex marriage. The majority of U.S. states held referenda on that exact subject, and it passed. So, like, what, are you, the, what world are you A majority of the American people go look at polling. A majority of the American people, and by the way, the Supreme Court of the United States. Right? He's going to uphold the laws. But at the moment when it was... La Look, I'm not arguing against gay marriage, just to be totally clear. I'm just saying to be out to be out or beyond, as you put it, the ideological friends, you have to have a view that is held by a tiny minority, and you have not named one. He believes... So this is a slur against he believes, him. Wait, now, wait a second. He believes that the Confederate flag, as he said a couple of years ago, uh, represents a great achievement of the United States. Okay, well, I don't even know what that means, but that's that's the basis upon which you're saying he's, quote, beyond, I think the, that's ideological beyond the ideological You're ideological carrying free. water for the Democratic Party, and I'm you're smearing this guy without, without engaging his ideas. That's I wrote about this saying. before this even became an issue. You, you know, this guy, um, it annoys me when a guy like this gets a job and a good person doesn't, okay? Because this guy is an intellect, is, is a ideological hack. I mean, there's no other way to describe it. He's a hack, um, and but he has a he has a good paying job. And and listen, he says, "Well, I wrote it before Sessions was named." 
Well, you know, we're not that stupid, Mr. Allen. Listen, Sessions was one of the big supporters of Donald Trump. It was probably not much of a stretch to understand that Sessions was going to get some position in the new administration. So you wrote it because you knew you wanted to, you wanted to put out the Democratic talking points. Ahead. It just Look, here's the facts on Jeff Sessions. He desegregated schools. He got the death penalty for the KKK murderer. As a U.S. attorney, Sessions filed several cases to desegregate schools in Alabama, and he also prosecuted the head of the state clan, Henry Francis Hayes, for abducting and killing Michael Donald, a black teenager selected at random. Sessions insisted on the death penalty for Hayes. When he was, and by the way, Hayes was executed, I believe. When he was later elected to state attorney general, Sessions followed through and made sure Hayes was executed. The successful prosecution of Hayes also led to a $7 million civil judgment against the Klan, effectively breaking the Klan back of the KKK in Alabama. So uh, Sultan Ganesh has a good thing about you're being lied to. Media schizophrenia talks about, listen to a little bit of this, the people bending and rioting and screaming were living in a cozy reality. Everyone in that progressive reality understood that history was on their side, that the majority was with them, and that the right was a, de a decaying mass of racist and corporations soon to be swept away by the tide of change. By the way, they believe corporations are right-leaning. Does that really bear out in reality? Corporations are about making money. And so that's why they'll come out in support of same-sex marriage and other things. So they think it's a way for them to make money. So they're not ideologically right. So Dan, this is Daniel Greenfield. But this wasn't reality. It was a carefully constructed narrative that fooled even the people who were building it. It was a virtual world overlaid with the real world. Its narratives were so integrated with the real world that it seemed as if it were real. There were stories and polls. Everyone in their social media bubble, except the few crazy uncles, agreed with them. All the celebrities were on board. And then the holodeck got switched off. You know what the holodeck is? That's the virtual reality machine on Star Trek, I think. My wife watches it. You can, she watched it, I didn't. It was a, wasn't a unique experience. Most Nazis didn't understand what was happening when the tanks broke through to Berlin. The average Russian wasn't prepared for the fall of the USSR. Propaganda is a very effective tool for managing a population, but the trouble with a lie is that sooner or later it falls apart. A narrative that isn't reality, it's a story we tell. Reality has no story except one shaped by a far higher power than any mere mortal. No ideological victory is permanent. The left's conviction that demographic change will give them ultimate power was always a foolish delusion. The left's efforts at absolute power scar society. That can be easily seen across Asia, Latin America, and the territories of the Warsaw Pact. It can also be, in, be increasingly seen in the United States. The level of political polarization continues to rise. There is increasingly no middle ground. The left blames this on the Republicans, but historically it's the left that has abused its power to force change more than the right. Obama taught a master class in simply doing whatever you want because history is on your side. The reaction to that led directly to President Trump. And too much of the left is incapable of the self-awareness needed to grasp this simple fact. Instead of stopping, the left is doubling down and is convinced that it can break through it if it pushes hard enough, and it's probably right. But its victories are temporary. The damage is long-lasting. They're not going to quit. The left won't win, but it can destroy America. And many of its ideologues hate the country enough that they would consider that a victory. If nothing else, America proved, provided a model that served as a counterweight to the ideal leftist society. Wrecking that model was already an ideological win for the left. The right didn't have to fix communist societies. That was a bonus. It just had to wreck them. The left doesn't seem to fix America. It just has to wreck it so it seems as unworkable. There's other things, uh, and I don't really have time to do this, um, but you know, now they talk about there's anti-Muslim hate crimes at the highest level since 2001. Ibrahim Hooper, a spokesman for the CARE, Council on American Islamic Relations, said that he believed the anti-Muslim rhetoric that came out of the presidential campaign was to blame and that he feared there will be more hate crimes this year. Where are they getting this from? Whenever you have one of the nation's leading public figures in the person of Donald Trump mainstreaming and empowering Islamophobia in the nation, it's the inevitable result, he said. Before and after Trump's election, there were reports of hateful acts across the country. The Southern Poverty Law Center, drawing on news accounts, social media postings, and direct reports, said it had tallied 201 incidents of election-related harassment and intimidation as of Friday. The Southern Poverty Law Center is a hate group. 
it is a documented, well-established, leftist, well-funded hate group. And if you remember, it was about a year ago that I stood here and I told you about a conference that went at Georgetown, and here's John Carlin, who's an assistant attorney general of the United States, talking about what, how wonderful it is that we have now partnered the Department of Justice to get a grip on domestic terrorism. We have partnered with the Southern Poverty Law Center. They also announced the, uh, the, global, the Strong Cities thing, that the global initiative uh, that uh, Lord Lynch was pushing. Um, let me see here, I got to scroll through this. These are from his remarks. He said that since its creation in 1971, Southern Poverty Law Center has been an important voice on the wide range of extremist groups throughout this country. The SPLC does the noble work of examining what the threat is, observing it, and reporting on it. That's just a big, fat lie. The SPLC says it places groups and concerning conservative Christian groups on its hate list. This is a direct quote from his remarks at Georgetown in October 14, 2015. Put it put Christian groups on its hate list based on their beliefs, not their propensity for violence. Heidi Brush, the SPLC's intelligence project director, teamed with Carlin to demonize pro-family groups. He's told a reporter that the SPLC classifies groups as hate groups on the basis of ideology. And how did that play out itself? You remember this guy went in with the Chick-fil-A sandwiches with the names of the people, Tony Perkins and others at the Family Research Council, and it was a, it was a, for a quick thinking guard that, that got the guy. I think the guard was wounded, uh, but they were able to catch this guy before he went in. And how did this guy learn about the Southern Poverty or the uh, Family Research Council being a hate group? Well, he found it on the uh, website, the hate website, hate map of the Southern Poverty Law Center. And you could go look at it, and you can look, and you'll see there, uh, click on, you. Click on Washington, D.C., and you see there uh, Traditional Values Coalition, Center for Family and Human Rights, and the Family Research Council. If you click on the anti-Muslim one, you come up with the Center for Security Policy. It's a left-wing group. In fact, a lot of you know Coach Dave from Past Assault. Past Assault is on there. Linda Harvey from um, her uh, local group. I can't remember the name of it right off the top of my head. She's on the website as a, as a hate group. Because why? Because it's ideology. This is the way the left thinks. So here's their page on the Family Research Council. Now what we're going to do, what's the, so the Democrats have a problem. In fact, look at, look at this map. Uh, this is what happened uh, in 2009 after Barack Obama's first win. You see the red states that controlled the majority, like the legislature and the governor and the, uh, the Senate and each of those states. Now look at the map down there. Look at the change, and you can see the numbers. 33 Republican governors out of 50. <coughs> they control the, uh, both houses in the, the, the Congress of the, uh, the representatives in each of those states in red. So what's their solution? So what are the Democrats going to do to overcome this problem? Great article by Caroline Glick called The Ellison Challenge in Friday's Jerusalem Post, the most, so she goes, she talks about one option. One option would be to be sort of like move to the center like Bill Clinton did. The second option is to go further back along the leftist trajectory that Bar President Barack Obama set the party off on eight years ago. This is the favorite option of the Bernie Sanders wing of the party. Sanders supporters refer to this option as the populist course. This, um, I can't remember what the first word there is. Is being played, this is being played out today on the ground by the anti-Trump protesters who refuse to come to terms with the Trump victory and insistently defame Trump as a Nazi or Hitler and his advisors as Goebbels. For the Democrats, such a populist course will require them to become more racialist, more authoritarian in their political correctness, angry and more doctrinaire, will also require them to become an anti-Semitic party. Anti-Semitism, like the hatred of police and Christians, is a necessary component of democratic populism. This is true first and foremost because they will need scapegoats to blame for all the bad things that you can't solve by demonizing and silencing your political opponents. Jews, and particularly the Jewish state, along with evangelical Christians and cops, are the only groups that you're allowed to hate, discriminate against, and scapegoat in the authoritarian 
politically correct universe. From the party's post-initial election moves, it appears that the Democrats have decided to take the latter path. Congressman Keith Ellison from Minneapolis is now poised to be selected as the next leader of the Democratic National Committee. Um, I don't have time to go through all of it. Read her column in the Jerusalem Post. Also go to the Powerline blog. Scott Johnson, a uh, lawyer up in um, the Minneapolis area, has written a good article, Takedown. This is from like 10 years ago on Keith Ellison. He's Muslim. He was part of the Nation of Islam. And he denies it. And so this is the path that they were take. Here's the other. So they're going to take this path. They're, they're not going to change. Okay? That's the thing that needs to be understood. They will not change. So it needs to be dealt with. They're also going to try to shut down opposition. Here's a little, I know, it's only got another 60 days, so we've got to play a few clips of his you know, before he goes away. And part of what makes me most optimistic is if you look at the attitudes of young people. Across the board, uh, young people are much more comfortable with <laughs> respecting differences. They are much more comfortable with uh, diversity. Uh, they are much less likely to express um, uh, attitudes that divide us be between us and them. What planet is this guy living on? I, you know, it does seem like we live in these parallel universes. And listen, I'm just telling you, church, you need to understand that this is, this is going to happen in culture, it's going to happen in church, and it's going to get worse until the Lord comes back. Just, just going to have to deal with it and stand strong in the faith. Sound doctrine. Stay away from itching you know, people who will itch your ears. Okay? I'm not, I hope I'm not itching your ears by telling you that it's going to get worse. <laughs> if that's itching your ears, then you guys you might need some psychological help, but... Um, it, I don't think it changes until the Lord comes back. So while we have this maybe respite from, you know, sort of a, a pause in this in our country a little bit, it's not going away. It's going to be a constant fight. And so Obama is, um, well, I mean, really, seriously, you're talking about the uh, commitment to diversity of these guys? that are running around, um, it's, um, it's crazy. Okay, so I'm going to take about six or seven minutes to do a little bit on the Middle East. Um, and to our foreign people who watch this that, you know, they don't like me talking about the United States, all I only talk about is because we are, you know, a fairly important country in the world, and what happens here happens elsewhere. Uh, and there's so much going on on a geopolitical context of conflicts and that type of thing that it's difficult to deal with. The Wall Street Journal recognized this yesterday in their Saturday review section when President Trump goes to war. It's not a question, really, of if. It's when, because of the state of the world. I mean, just look around, and I do think President Trump is a realist, and he would like to avoid these conflicts, but it's just not possible because we really are a very you know, globalist society where things are impacted. It was reported this week that Russia has this new missile that can fly at 4,000 miles an hour. It can make it from Moscow to London in 10 minutes. That missile has, I tried to make up a graphic to depict it, and I couldn't quite get the graphic. So you see the nuclear explosion. It can carry nuclear warheads. And those nuclear warheads that this one missile can carry has the firepower. So if, if this mushroom cloud there represents Hiroshima or Nagasaki, okay, this is 200 of those. And so I would say, wow, if it's 200 times more powerful than Hiroshima, that's something to be a little bit concerned about. Well, it's not 200 times more powerful. You need 10 of those slides. It's over 2,000 times more powerful and what it can unleash, it would, it would take out Europe. One missile, effectively, with all the multiple warheads. So we also see this in the Middle East. This is from the Daily Mail in London, that 
Russia is moving on Aleppo. And so then the question is, what's President Trump going to do? Is he going to participate in this? They're firing cruise missiles in there. It's been kind of on hold for the last couple, three weeks, but now it's heating up again. They have all their fleet there off in the Western Mediterranean, off the coast of Syria. They have the aircraft, the one aircraft carrier that they have didn't break down on the way, which was good for them, I guess. But so they have all this firepower there. They're going to try to protect Assad. And the question is, you know, as you kind of analyze, you know, everybody wants to say, well, Obama created ISIS and did this and all this, and we should support Assad. Assad's a great, listen, Assad is a thug, okay? Just like Saddam Hussein was a thug. But the problem is, because of the warring factions and tribal militias and all that sort of thing in those societies over there, you break the, the big guy at the top, what do you have? You have a Libya, you have an Iraq, and all this other thing. And so it is a, uh, it's a major problem. So do you support Assad and let him have a little bit of the country? You know, do you get rid of ISIS? Well, what happens if you get rid of ISIS? Do you have Iraqi Shiite militias that take, uh, take control of that area? Um, it's a problem. Um, Theresa May, Prime Minister of England, of Great Britain, was in, um, Germany this week also. They had a meeting. I hear that it didn't end that well uh, because she's insisting on doing Brexit and Angela Merkel doesn't like that. Um, Germany at the same time is cracking down. 60 cities had raids to get down on the Salafist terrorists. Uh, Europe's a mess. This is kind of an interesting, this sort of shows the progression of the war and civilian casualties by month since 2011. You see it peaking at over 5,000 one month. I mean, it's, it's way over 300,000 people killed in Syria now. Um, this is kind of a comparison between Syrian casualties from ISIS and Syrian casualties from Russia. So I'm not one that says, oh, Russia's doing great. Isn't Russia so nice to come in there? They're coming in there for their own purposes, okay? You, people need to understand that. They're not white knights. And I don't know there are any white knights over there. But look at this with uh, European military expenditure. Now, there were a lot of reports this week, we're going to build a military in Europe. You know, Britain's leaving because they had most of the military firepower. They're leaving, so we're going to make this great European army. Well, it's not going to happen overnight. The only country that can maybe afford it, and even that's questionable, is Germany right now. So it's going to take years. Here's a, here's a good graphic to show the decline in manpower, in the Europe, from UK, Germany, Italy, France, and Spain, the big military powers in uh, the European Union. Look at look at how things have dropped in just the last 13 years. Look, battle tanks have gone from about 6,000 down to about 1,500. That takes a long time to build that up. I know I listened to some interviews this week of people who are going to build up military here in the United States. Guess what? It's going to take I mean, like a nuclear carrier takes a couple years to bring come online under the best of circumstances. I know Britain has a couple, the United Kingdom has a couple that are coming online that are really pretty awesome aircraft carriers, but they've been under underway for, for years now. So this building Europe into this massive military power is just, I think it's going to take years. But they, they really want to do it. Here's what the Wall Street Journal said, but the UK's decision to leave the EU and now the election of Mr. Trump have given fresh impetus for efforts to build what officials call your, Europe's strategic autonomy, an ability to act independently of other major powers. They don't have that power now, by the way. In his presidential campaign, Mr. Trump questioned the relevance of NATO military alliance and suggested American military support could be conditional on European spending. And it's going to take a while to build that up. Let's see. Okay, let's look at this and we'll close with this. Um, well, two things real quick. Uh, this is what I talked about earlier. The Shiite militias are crashing the Mosul offensive. Here's what's happening is when they started this uh, battle, you see Mosul here on the right. You see Syria up there. That area is under ISIS control, effectively. And What's interesting in the way they've devised their plans to go in there is that 
there was about a 20-mile-wide corridor from Mosul all the way over to Syria that nobody was supposed to go into. And the thinking is they were going to let ISIS escape. They would have less, you know, they would leave Mosul. There would be less casualties there. They're crucifying, beheading people, burning them alive. And the Iraqi militias are coming in. And guess what? They're, from all reports I've seen, is they're doing the same thing. <laughs> so you're replacing one bad power with another bad power, I see. So what happened is the Iraqi Shiite militias that are influenced and controlled by Iran are moving into the area to effectively close that off. And when they're moving into this Tel Afar area, they've, they've taken these cities down here that are, oh, they're probably 30 miles outside of Mosul. They're really being brutal with the people there because they have scores to settle from the breakup of Iraq. And they remember those. If this happened in 200 years, they would have scores to settle. Just like in Serbia and Bosnia, they have scores to settle that go back 500 years. It's part of their historical narrative. So this is going to be a problem. They're moving into Mosul. As one person said, this is from the New York Times Magazine this morning. Um, the Peshmerga from the Kurd, Kurdish Peshmerga militias are moving into Mosul. One guy said, I feel 100 years old. I hope this ISIS goes to hell and rots in hell. So they're moving into Mosul. And this is, this, I think it's going to take a while, but it's a, um, I'm hearing massive civilian casualties already. And, um, and so now the Kurds and the Arabs are at each other. The New York Times this morning had talked about how Saudi Arabia and Iranian proxy wars are tearing the Middle East apart. At the same time, you have what's going on with the UN sort of targeting Israel. Um, Naftali Bennett, the education minister in Israel, has come out and said, listen, U.S., don't do anything until you get your new president there. The Israeli right is feeling empowered because of people being hired like Steve Bannon, who despite the claims is not an anti is not anti-Semitic or anti-Jewish. Uh, the New York Times is upset because Israel's going to approve settlements in Judea and Samaria and they're concerned about this. Their editorial this morning said this, Education Minister Naftali Bennett, who heads the Jewish Home Party, the most ardent supporter of settlements, proclaimed that the era of the Palestinian state is over. This is at odds with the Israeli government's official position, which holds out hope for a two-state solution, an outcome Washington has sought to broker for decades. But we know that they failed in all of this. Um, so, Big problems, everything going on in the Middle East. And we'll talk more, well, I'll talk more about that in Bakersfield next week, and we'll put an update up. And um, I feel like I, have, I should have some kind of nice little bow to put on this one. And I don't other than that, well, there are things I found encouraging about the election results. Uh, I did an interview, I won't. It was over an hour long, so I'm not going to sit here and tell you what the interview was about because you'll be here forever. Uh, Love of the Truth Radio with Cindy Hartline. We did it the other night, and it's up on the Internet now. You can find it for Love of the Truth uh, Radio. And while I'm encouraged in some respects about some changes that I'm seeing, the moral rot and decay and problems that we have in America have not gone away. You know, we're still a deeply fractured society. We have a lot of, we have a moral problem, we have a drug problem, we have all these problems. And the only solution is Jesus Christ. So the church can't take a breath and relax. That's what I'm trying to say. Now's the time to bear down more than ever. Because we've been given a little bit, it appears, a little bit of a reprieve from some things that appear to be coming. And we could tick off about 15 or 20 things that would have happened at Hillary Clinton um, by the way, somebody, you know, send her a bottle of shampoo. She looked awful in her <laughs> interview, her speech the other day. So, you know, pray for these people that they get saved because that's really their only hope. So let's pray and get out of here. Father, thank you so much for the truth that you've given us. And Lord, I pray that you will renew our commitment to be committed to the truth of the Word of God and the wonderful message, the good news of the gospel. Pray that you'll give us opportunities to share that. Bless us this week. In Jesus' name, amen.